Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Kishore Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you to this public lecture by my good friend, uh, Yanni Eliasson, the Deputy Secretary General uh, of the UN. Uh, I think you all know that uh, it's a tradition now, I only make three points uh, when I address the, U, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Someday I hope to count beyond three, but right now I'm sticking to three. <laughs> and my first point is to ask, in a sense, the biggest question surrounding the UN, which is, is the UN a sunrise? or a sunset organization? I ask this question because frankly, if you read, if you read the American media, and maybe some other Western media, you get the sense that you know, this UN is a place that is a relic from the past. It's something we have to tolerate. But it's not something that has a great future. But Jan and I, uh, and as I explain later, we've served together, are both great believers in the UN. And I actually believe that the UN is about to go into one of its most promising chapters ever in the decades to come. And I mentioned that, and you'll see why I mentioned that, because I've argued this case at great length in my new book, it's called The Great Convergence, <laughs> Asia, the West, and the Logic of One World. And I just gave Jan a copy of it, and he promised to read it on the flight back, Jan. So you'll get, you get your reading assignment test uh, next week. <laughs> uh, but seriously, it is an extremely important organization, and it's one that we should actually both support and cherish, because it is going to make a huge future a huge contribution to the future of the world. So my second point is about Sweden uh, and the United Nations. And I, I want to make this point because, you know, the UN has got countries which are detractors. I mean, it's not a secret that the United States has been a major detractor uh, of the United Nations, trying to cut its budget, trying to attack it in many ways. But Sweden has consistently been one of the countries that has always supported the United Nations. And indeed, some of the greatest uh, figures who have served in the UN have come from Sweden. Uh, certainly, and frankly, everybody, when I serve as ambassador to the UN twice, uh, everyone in the UN would disagree on many things. But all of us agreed that the greatest Secretary General that the UN ever had was Dark Hammarskjöld, because he set a benchmark that was so high and that was so amazing. And, but of course, he wasn't the only one. There were others like Folk Bernadotte, the UN Security Council's first mediator in the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. In fact, he was assassinated in the line of duty um, and of course, you've had 80,000 Swedish military and civilian personnel who have served in UN peacekeeping operations worldwide around the world. In fact, you'll also discover when you go to the UN that the design of the, uh, the ECOSOP chamber was made by a Swedish architect, Sven Markilius, and I think was given as a gift from the Swedish government to the UN. So I think, frankly, if there's one lesson that Singapore, I think, can and ought to learn from Sweden is how to become as strong as Sweden in supporting the United Nations. And I hope your visit here, Jan, will happy to do this. Will be, will help to do this. Now, my last point, of course, is to introduce the speaker, who in many ways needs no introduction. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, he's an old friend. In fact, we met in 1988 when I was serving my first stint as ambassador to the UN. That's when Jan arrived there. And that's now about 25 years ago, but we have stayed in close touch since then. Uh, my only complaint about Jan is that uh, uh, I came back uh, from ambassador to the UN and then came to work in the foreign ministry, and they went back to the UN. Jan kept on rising and rising, and kept doing more and more important jobs. So I, he and I agreed I will not give you his whole CV, 
but he has served as President of the UN General Assembly, the 60th General Assembly, when Ambassador Van der Gopal Menon was the, our ambassador there. He's also been the Sweden's ambassador to the United States, and more importantly, he's also appointed Foreign Minister of Sweden uh, uh, after that. Uh, he's, of course, uh, uh, besides serving as ambassador to the UN, he's also served as the Secretary General's representative on many areas, including for the very difficult issues uh, for Iran and Iraq. He was also the first UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs. So you can see his involvement uh, with the United Nations has been long and deep, and therefore, I must say, the Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki moon, made a brilliant choice when he selected Jan Eliasson to be the Deputy Secretary General. So, with that, please join me in welcoming him to the stage. He will speak for 25 minutes, and then we'll have a conversation over here. Thank you very much, uh, Kishore. When you read my CV, it's just a remi reminder of my age, but um, I, I would say on the first count, yes, uh, sunrise. But we are probably uh, facing a very cloudy day with a bit of thunder also, but I'm on the sunrise side. And I like the uh, title of your book, or rather the subtitle, The, the Logic of One World. And I, think, I hope that we will see that logic prevail in reality also in the future. Uh, to you, uh, who are associated with Le Kuan uh, Yu School of Public Policy, uh, I just want to congratulate you. You are quite a, a renowned uh, international entity and uh, much respected. And uh, to be associated and above all to study here and be inspired by uh, such a great uh, leader as uh, Kishore Mababani is a privilege, uh, but also something that you will have with you in life. And I think you will be better prepared for the kind of world that we are uh, going to face uh, by working and studying in this environment than you could be in anywhere else. And uh, I commend you for this school's uh, public policy work. I also think the, uh, the work in, the, uh, in, the, as public, for, in public service is going to be ever more crucial. Uh, since in my view, uh, leadership and institutions are going to be challenged more and more. Institutions are under pressure of expectations, but also perhaps not delivering as much as is expected. So therefore, we need our best minds uh, and best uh, efforts to strengthen that public sector, the leadership qualities that are needed for institutions, whether they are public or private, but leadership is going to be crucial and you're going to be well prepared. On a lighter note, uh, it's uh, just wonderful to see my dear friend Kishore. Uh, we found uh, each other very quickly. Um, I, I was very much uh, inspired by this refreshing directness that was uh, characterizing your work. I used the phrase uh, a, a while ago that you, you were never deformed by diplomacy. <laughs> Uh, and I have as a line, when people say that you are so diplomatic, they usually mean that you've been very vague. <laughs> and I say, that's not what diplomacy is all about. <laughs> diplomacy is clarity. And that's where we found each other. And uh, that's why it's been such a great joy to follow you through the years. You said that I had formally, I, I used the word formally, went on to higher and higher career. but. By God, you really made your name known, but also your views known. And uh, been, you've been more influential than most of us serving in diplomacy. And uh, I look forward to the day when I can be on my own and, and, uh, and uh, take a role also in the public debate. But I'm very glad to be with you. And uh, I, I thought um, that I would like to uh, first, uh, see whether we can really prove that we have uh, a new world and that we have a new reality that we need to take into account. I claim that that is the case. Uh, looking back at my diplomatic career, I would say that the last five, six years is a period where I've seen more dramatic change than ever before. And uh, after this, I just want to like, make some points about how international uh, cooperation uh, then will be challenged in this new uh, environment. And then I look forward to the, the, uh, the discussion between us and also comments and questions from you. Well, on the first point, how the world has changed, I, I don't need to say here 
that we have seen a very uh, substantial and clear uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic shift in the world. Uh, that is so well known that I simply don't want to divulge the theory. It's so, so clear that the, the, uh, the emphasis on the world economy and uh, trade and so forth is moving the, in the direction of Asia. What I would like to add to this is also that we, during this last five, six years, particularly clearly have seen the uh, role of what uh, about 10 years ago was called the emerging economies. Uh, I would uh, today rather use the phrase emerging powers. Uh, you don't need to, I don't need to name them, but you know who they are. They are countries who have been growing by 5 to 10 percent. They are countries of great population, uh, big optimism, self-confidence, uh, and with a growing influence not only economically and, po and politically. Some of them are aspiring members to the Security Council and frustrated that they are not having a place in the Security Council. So to the pattern of the uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic shift to Asia, I would add the growing influence of the uh, emerging powers. And that takes different form. They sometimes, out of impatience, create their own, create their own groupings. One of them is BRICS. Uh, and also have earlier, of course, brought about the extension of G7, G8 to G20. There are just a few signs of this uh, need for a more clear and, and, and uh, uh, recognized position in the main decision bodies of the uh, global community. So that would be my first point, and that is clearly something that was not the case 20 years ago, but is the case now. The second uh, point that I'd like to make is, is also possibly a banality, but I just don't think we still have taken into account how serious this issue is, or how important it is, and how revolutionary it is. And that is the revolution in communications and information technology. Uh, that is absolutely uh, uh, of an enormous significance, not only technically how we can be reaching ourselves and, and how the, what goes on in the streets in Northern Africa and the Middle East or in, in Tehran, streets of Tehran, how that is now out in the world, or that nobody can ever more hide anything. Twenty years ago, uh, there were dictators around the world who kept the world outside. They didn't know. But now the images are there and the communication facilities are there. I'll just give you a little short anecdote. I was in Darfur, mediating in the, in the war uh, in Darfur between the parties, and I was sitting with the elders in a, a Jebel Mara area in northern Darfur. I convinced these 80-year-old men who were the leaders of the villages there that they should call in their young hotheads who were out in the conflict to go to the negotiation table. I felt very proud, and they said to me, of course, you realize that we have have uh, some uh, grievances vis-a-vis -vis the government. Uh, yes, of course, well, sharing of power and sharing of uh, wealth is one of the negotiation subjects. Well, and then I went to the helicopter very happy that they had promised to call, call their, their young militants to go to the negotiation table. Going to the helicopter to go back to El Fasher, I saw them almost run off to a, another acacia tree where we have talked. And they took up their, I don't have it on me now, their, phone, their, their phones, their uh, cell phones. And I said to myself, my God, they are calling, they are calling their nephews, their hotels, ask them to go to the negotiations. I was wrong. When I landed in El Fasher, Al Jazeera was there. They had called Al Jazeera and said that the negotiators have agreed that they have legitimate grievances of wealth sharing and power sharing, and that's why we now decided to return to the, to the negotiation table. And here I was from Ericsson country, neighbor to the Nokia country, uh, and completely on the information defensive. Three of these men were illiterate. So just as an example of what kind of new world we have, and what this means, you could probably uh, multiply that example several times around. Third change is, of course, the fact that you in this room uh, are the first ones in history that have an existential threat to the, this planet on which we live. Our parents never thought about climate change, did they? Uh, or whatever, the, the, also the whole environmental movement that has now grown into something extremely important, and which has led us to a situation where we 
We, we have to also bring in that existential element in everything we do, whether it is economic growth or, or, or uh, even conflict resolution. That factor has to be brought in. And uh, I have a line to help you in discussions. If you, want, if you believe in what I say, I will give you a line that has helped me in some debates. When you know that you have an idea and people want to put you down and discourage you, they say, well, that might work, but what's your plan B? Have you heard that before? Well, if you have a discussion on the future of the planet or the environmental threats and you don't think that that comes home uh, to the other side, then you say, well, I might not have a plan B, but there's certainly no planet B. We don't have a planet B. That's the third point. Uh, then I think I would just enumerate a few other factors which have taken on quite a different magnitude and seriousness as related to the past, and that is migration. Global international migration is a huge issue. I don't need to develop it. You, you, you know yourself what this means in terms of numbers, what it means for remittances, what it means for pressures inside societies, what it means also in terms of unfortunately discussion about migration policies, which at least in Europe and the United States that I follow right now have taken on a rather sensitive quality. Then I would say urbanization. In five years' time, more than six. No, sorry, in five to six years' time, we will have around 60% of humanity living in urban areas. So this huge move into cities uh, is, of course, of great importance also, not least for certain uh, issues related to uh, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, like sanitation and, and water resources. Uh, a last factor that I'd like to mention, which you and I discussed going up here, because you gave me a rather positive picture of how religions and ethnic groups can live together in Southeast Asia. And I said I hope that will continue because we really have a positive, need to have a positive message. Because what I have seen in my years at the United Nations and my, my most recent work is a growing role, unfortunately, of divide, a growing tendency of dividing people into ethnic different categories, religious or ethnic or sectarian. In Syria, it's now blatant. Even in the Mali conflict, we have that element. Once the extremists are gone from northern Mali, we now have a problem of looking into the, the old problems of the Tuaregs versus the South. Uh, and that comes back, that element comes back in so many areas, and I hope very much that Southeast Asia will continue to be good examples. There are some worrying signs, as you know. Uh, so th this, I think, by this I've said enough to hopefully convince you that, yes, uh, we live in a new world. Uh, and if we then would follow the subtitle of your book, Kishore, we should say, by the logic of this, we should have one world. But uh, we don't yet. We, I hope we will move in that direction. Uh, we live in a world where you now have so many complex problems. We have complex problems. We have multifaceted problems. We have global problems. Practically all our national agenda is also international by nature. If that is the problem, then of course we need to have global and, and multifaceted solutions. And that requires good international cooperation. So that is the logic. But here we still have this tension between nation state and uh, the, global, uh, the global requirements. We still haven't reached the stage which I think, I hopefully, we one day will reach. I was about to say, I have a dream, <laughs> but that was a too, too presumptuous. But my, if I were to have a dream on this area, it is that the work for international cooperation should be going in the direction that we have an obligation to produce such good solutions or such good formulas on the international scene that they are considered a national interest by the member states of the UN. That's what we have to achieve in the end, that the international solution is a national interest. When we have reached that stage, that's when you get the support of the political parties, in the parliament, with the editorial writers, by public opinion. But as long as public opinion is saying, well, this international is one agenda, the national is another one, and you see a certain contradiction between the two, that's where we have the problems. But the logic is that the national agenda and the international agenda is the same. 
It's probably easier for countries like Singapore and Sweden to come to that conclusion than for the larger countries who always have greater freedom of action. So that's my first reflection that, in fact, the international solution is a national interest, but we haven't reached that stage yet. The other one is to take away the false line between global and local. Because in the end, the changes have to be made locally. Uh, and I think we are semantically putting us in, a, in an unfortunate position by, by making this strong distinction between local, national, and global, since it is practically the same on all levels. So my line on this is simply that, have you thought of the fact that global is practically always somebody else's local? Global is somebody else's local. So therefore, to make sure that we, in order to be, be effective in the United Nations, we have to make sure that we connect what we do globally to what is relevant regionally. As you and I have talked about yesterday, the ASEAN, the Nordics, the globally, regionally, uh, nationally, and in the end, locally. Um, then, of course, if we are to reach these solutions, really, come close to them, we have to have a new working method. If this, these problems are so complex, so multifaceted, then it's practically uh, impossible to reach these solutions if we try to solve the problems by what I would call the vertical method, the sectorial method, or the uh, silo method. We need to think and act horizontally cross-cutting, taking down borders. Because otherwise, we don't have the instruments to deal with these complex realities. In the past, you might have been able to solve your own problems by being the expert in your own sector, in your own silo. But that's not true today. This doesn't mean that we should in any way reduce the requirement for skill and experience in whatever you are good at. But when it comes to then solving the problems on the ground, in reality, you need to cross horizontally and bring in economic, social, political factors, human rights factors, psychological factors into the problem solving. This is almost a revolution uh, inside the United Nations, I can tell you openly, uh, to, because we have very much, unfortunately, uh, a way of working in ver uh, vertically. And I think one of our great tasks for us who are here, I see several of you here, uh, the, the resident coordinator and others, that we really need to work very much as a team and cross borders, but not only inside the UN, but also vis-a-vis -vis others. The, uh, with, with governments, of course, with the private sector, with business, uh, with each, each individual uh, member of the academic community and uh, citizens as such. In order to solve today's problem, we have to mobilize all the energy that is available around these global issues. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And, and to get that energy, you know, that's where we have to, to work, uh, uh, as I said, horizontally. Uh, I gave a speech at uh, Uppsala. I was very honored to give the dog Hamasher lecture at 50 years exactly after his death on the 18th of September 1961. So 18th of September 2011, I gave a speech at Uppsala University. And I just said to <coughs> my colleague that I will send it to you tomorrow. That speech is peace, development, human rights, the indispensable connection. And Vannemann knows that was the formula that we had in the, in the document that was adopted on the 16th of September 2005 in the UN General Assembly. And I was very happy to, to gavel that decision, uh, get, gavel that document. And it says very simply this, as you may have heard from others, there is no peace without development, but there is no development without peace. And there is no lasting peace or sustainable development without respect of human rights. Or I would add today the rule of law. So if one of these sectors is weak, peace, development, human rights, then the whole structure is weak. It's not like we, in the 70s, I remember from my own academic uh, studies that there was some philosophy that first you have peace, then you have development, and then you can develop human rights. It's rather primitive, isn't it? I mean, of course, you have to work with all three at the same time. If it's weak, it weakens the system immediately and very quickly. So that's why, again, 
we need to work horizontally, bring down walls, uh, and, and get the dynamics across the board. Uh, and uh, that, that, that perhaps hopefully confirms that analysis on my side. So um, I, will, I have four or five minutes left, and I will only say, to, put the, to put, make this a little bit more practical, that my work in the UN under the Secretary General is to uh, take, oversee the whole political sector, which includes peacekeeping, uh, and uh, also human rights and humanitarian affairs, which is my old area. Uh, my second area is to work with the uh, post-2015 development agenda uh, to make sure that we, after the MDGs, which are now in force, not so good in some areas, but still, we will have an agenda which points to the future. First, we have to achieve the goals, the MDGs. We have 980 days left. The Secretary General launched a thousand day drive about three weeks ago. We have lots to do, for instance, on sanitation, which is a huge challenge. We have lots to do on maternal health. We are doing well, uh, as you and I talked about earlier, on extreme poverty uh, and education. Good news on education. Practically every child learns to read and write in today's world. But we have lots of work to do on, on uh, particular sanitation. Uh, we also need to have formulas for financing for development, to have credibility in the negotiations that will follow in the General Assembly in a year or two. Uh, we need then to think what are the elements for that road ahead for development. And here I will conclude with what I think are the three most important elements for the road ahead after 2015. The first one is to never forget poverty eradication. Uh, there are grave inequalities both within uh, countries and between countries. And uh, I have particularly worked with Africa, South of Sahara, and uh, I have uh, seen with my own eyes uh, the disasters, the humanitarian, and also the huge famines and the death uh, that uh, is spreading enormously. But apart from poverty eradication, we have to add, if you remember my Planet B syn syndrome, we have to add the element of, uh, of sustainability. And I would hope that you will help bring down the possible contradictions between poverty eradication and uh, sustainability. In today's world, Every poverty eradication program has to have a sustainability component. And I would hope that we would see the two tracks merge, poverty eradication and sustainability, into one, so that we would have very concrete, sustainable development goals. The third element that I think is needed, which relates actually to your own school and your work here, is the importance of institutions. The importance of rule of law, the importance of the rights perspective, the importance of good governance. If we forget that we need to have uh, drivers, enablers, catalysts to bring about the change, we will, not, we will not make it. You look at Somalia, look at Afghanistan. One of the reasons that we had a recurrence of the conflicts was that institutions were never built up. So institutions are necessary for post-conflict uh, situations. But institutions are also absolutely necessary for development. Fighting corruption, having a strong legal structure, uh, trade, uh, trade rules, etc., that are valid and that are enforced, extremely important. And of course, uh, the relationship between rule of law and human rights is obvious. So here we have good news from the United Nations. On the 24th of September last year, the General Assembly came out with a declaration on the rule of law which is a huge, I was about to say, uh, the Swedish expression, smorgasbord, the huge a la carte menu with possibilities of institution building for both preserving uh, development and rule of uh, peace and security and human rights. And that document is now a tool in the hand of diplomacy. So uh, if the UN can pr produce a roadmap for the road ahead, on uh, the uh, post-2015 development agenda, then I think, Kishore, that we will have a much greater chance to move into that sunrise position in which we want to find ourselves. Uh, and, but we also then have to prove ourselves on the other sides of the UN, which is uh, the work for peace. And there, of course, Syria is a bleeding wound for us. 
Uh, we hope that we can meet the challenges also with peacekeeping in today's world, which becomes more and more uh, complicated with a peace enforcement, even a combat role for the UN in, in Mali and in DRC, uh, Congo that is, uh, which will, might even endanger the neutrality uh, of the United Nations. But I will not elaborate on that more now. I would rather put an end to, to my own introduction and uh, then uh, be very grateful to have the my, 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 my interlocuteur, who has not been deformed by diplomacy. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Jan. That was a great introduction. So I'm going to uh, ask the first three questions, and then great. we throw the floor uh, open for everyone else. And I hope you'll have some good challenging questions for Jan, because I know he likes to have a good, robust dialogue too. My, my first question, I guess, is the easy one is how do you explain the fact that uh, Sweden as a country has consistently been a strong supporter and a strong believer in the UN? And why are there, no, why are there not more Swedens in the world who support the UN as well as Sweden does? What's, what's the reason for that? Why are you so special? <laughs> well, I have here in the room uh, my Nordic colleagues. Uh, <laughs> And I think you are equally oriented towards uh, international cooperation. Now you're being diplomatic. <laughs> no. Well, we had such a friendly chat, of course, before. We, you wouldn't believe it. We were at war 300 years ago. Yeah. Denmark and, uh, and yeah. Sweden. But uh, no, actually, it's, it, if, I were, if I were sticking to Sweden, I think we have simply come to the conclusion that a good international order, a good international structure, strong United Nations, is in our national interest. I remember serving with Olaf Palme, the Prime Minister of Sweden, I was his foreign policy advisor, and he said in a speech uh, once that uh, a strong United Nations is our first line of defense. Everybody loved it except the defense minister, I remember. <laughs> but that shows, you know, that you, you, we, we simply think that if you have that structure of inter respect of international law, respect of uh, United Nations, the charter of the UN, which I always carry in my pocket. Wow. Yeah, here it is. Uh, that, 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 is uh, that is in our interest. And then we have, of course, had some towering figures. You mentioned, of course, the, the, the most important person, Dag Hammarskjöld. Uh, I grew up uh, with him. I was a young student, and he was my role model. He did, died did, on did, my... Did you ever meet him face to face? No, no. no. I was on a Navy exercise in the Baltic on the 18th of September, the day after he uh, died. And I was landed, stranded on, on an island in a survival exercise. And mm. as you know, we made, made it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Fortunately. Uh, yes. <laughs> and then on the radio, I heard... Uh, that um, Hammarskjöld had died. <coughs> and uh, somewhat sentimentally, I can concede to you that I, that's when I said to myself, I'm going to work in the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Now, he, he was a great proud tower figure. And then we have had, in our training for diplomacy, uh, we have also a, a strong element of, of uh, training in mediation mm -hmm. and conflict resolution. Uh, we also have a good academic tradition, with especially Uppsala University, uh, peace and uh, conflict research uh, department. No, it's, it's part of our culture, I would hope, and I hope it continues. I think it's part of your DNA already. Hope so. <laughs> okay, my second question. You know, you mentioned about the global and the local. And, you know, in, in the book that you promised to read on the flight back to New York, <laughs> I used a very simple uh, image to describe how the world has changed. Eh? And I say that in the past, when uh, 7 billion people live in 193 separate countries, it was as though they were living in 193 separate boats with captains and crews taking care of each boat. Yeah. But today, as a result of the world having shrunk, and you describe how the world has shrunk and become one place, the 7 billion people no longer live in 193 separate boats. The 7 billion people live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat but you have captains and crews taking care of each cabin and no captain or crew taking care of the boat as a whole. <laughs> and that's why we have a problem in terms of global challenges. And that's why you also, made the, this also goes to your point about planet A and planet B, that if you don't take care of planet A, we don't have planet B to go to. So from your point of view, if you have to convince, in a sense, uh, especially the governments, I think the people get it, 
the people support a stronger global response to global challenges, but countries are reluctant, uh, as you know. If you had to, in a sense, make the case that, hey, we are on the same boat, we are only on planet A and there's no planet B, what are the challenges you would highlight? I mean, I, I give the examples of greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, global pandemics, global terrorism, global financial crisis. But when you go out and make the case, what are the examples you use when you try to put across the case? Well, I, I think you, 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 you have to try to prove that the international solution, uh, the international formula is a national interest. Mm. Uh, it's pretty easy if you choose subjects like climate mm. or migration, where it's almost impossible to draw a line between uh, national and international. It might be more difficult in other areas, but basically you come back to the big paradox of the United Nations. Uh, in the charter, the first three words are, we the people. Yeah. Okay, we the peoples. But then who are they in the United Nations? They are the nations represented by the governments uh, in charge of these nations. So here you have sometimes the tragic collision between sovereignty and solidarity. If you have people dying in huge numbers because of even genocide or ethnic cleansing or mass starvation, you still have that borderline and the sovereignty and the territorial integrity that you know are so important for the members of the UN. Mm. So, tragically, sadly, we often have to say solidarity has to stop at a border and not at human beings in need. Mm. So, what we have to do is to, to develop an ethos where you try to, to see that we should, be, in the end, be accountable to what we achieve on the ground. On the other hand, if we cross that line and reduce the value of sovereignty, uh, you will have grave problems still inside the United Nations. Although the responsibility to protect, as you know, mm. was accepted, but it's, it's the first still time, con first controversial. Time, yeah. controversial. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, my, my, my third question, this is particularly relevant to the students of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, which is that you know, you've handled many difficult negotiations. You mentioned one in Darfur, you've done Iran, Iraq, and others. If you had to give advice to young people in this room who may want to go into diplomacy, who may want to try and handle difficult international negotiations, what are the rules you learned about negotiating? That you can, what are the oh, secrets of negotiating? Be you can careful, Kishore. This is a lecture that, <laughs> that I give in Uppsala every year. It's my favorite lecture, but I will give you the, I'll give you the summary of it. Yeah. Uh, the, half my pen was lost in the yeah. enthusiasm here. Yeah. No, but I will be very simple. Yeah, yeah, we'll, give, we'll give you five minutes. Peter Wall <laughs> no, Peter Wallenstein, the professor I mentioned, yeah. he asked me, could you, over the weekend, try to, uh, this was five years ago, could you try to give me the reasons why you failed or succeeded in negotiations? Yeah. Because he, everything was to be anecdotal, you know, situations, but he was trying to find some logic yeah, in why you fail or why you succeed in negotiations. And he forced me to think through these negotiations that I've been going through, six of them, I think. Iran, Iraq, Sudan, Nagorno-Karabakh, Somalia, Myanmar. I negotiated mm. return of Rohingyas mm. 20 years ago, by the way. Anyway, six of them. So I, I spent the weekend and I came to four conclusions. Mm. And this is pretty technical, but it, it's, 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 it is the, it, these areas are the failures and success. First one is your awareness of the language, of the word. This is our most important tool. All of you in this room will have your, the word as your primary tool to influence and change. Do we enough care about the nuances, about the, the, the choice of words? Do we have enough synonyms in a situation where you have to switch to make sure that you make it in the negotiation? So the power of the word. Hammarskjöld has a great line in markings that I could read to you, but I don't have the quote available right now. But it's, it's a great quote. So the word, the language. Second reason for failure or success is timing. How many times don't we do things too late? But I can tell you in diplomacy, how many times do, don't we fail because we do it too early? We don't have enough analysis of the timing aspects. 
and I have failures and successes in timing. Being too impatient or waiting too long. Third reason to fail or succeed is cultural sensitivity or insensitivity. If we don't have a, a power in curiosity, interest in learning more about the other side's culture, history, traditions, we lose the whole dimension of understanding that the other side comes to at peace or at ease, rather, with you. This no, it can never be manipulative. You have to be genuinely interested in other people, in other cultures. And that is such a tremendous gift when you have that. And I get so upset when I see people breaking against this rule, not showing respect for the other side, for the other people. And to spend time uh, knowing more about culture, history, tradition is an enormously good investment, apart from the fact that life becomes more fun and more interesting for yourself. You become a richer human being. And, and this, this is a very important factor. The, third, the fourth and last factor is the importance of personal relations. This might some, some, somewhat uh, felt sentimental, but friendship, trust, sympathy with friends that you've worked with, on the barricades, honestly working together always, uh, and seeing the human being behind whatever you're doing is a, such a tremendous gift. Uh, the fact that we kept contact all these years, that Vanu and I keep contact all these years, uh, and that we in situations where we really need each other, then we call each other and say, you are my side. Uh, you have to be on my side. And this is important. That's how we got the Human Rights Council through, I think. Our, our, this group that worked together, that was such a solid group, that, that, that explains uh, the success of the failures. So these were the four reasons, and it was less than five minutes. Thank you. One, wonderful. Well, this is very good practical advice. So the floor is open. Uh, please stand up, uh, come to the mic, uh, identify yourself, and ask a short, sharp question. <laughs> My name is Yoram Mom. I'm a businessman here in Singapore, but I'm Swedish. Uh -huh. Origin. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Hans is, is cool and you're the more origin. Me too. <laughs> yeah, cool. I know. <laughs> 1962 to 65. Yeah. And you? 68, 71. Oh, yeah. young man. Young man. <laughs> Thank you. I have two questions. Um, one is, um, when do we get a worldwide election of the Secretary of the United Nations? Where people and countries can be engaged in, a, let's say, campaigns or let's say, listening to arguments and competing values for the leadership of this huge and very important institution? This is one question. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, what do we do with all the failing states? Uh, there are more and more fail failing states coming up in the world, and now we see a long row of them in the Middle East. And how can the international community really help these countries to get a new start? You know, when you have companies failing, you have company doctors, you have restructuring coming in, you, you change the board, you do a lot of things to re-innovate, re rejuvenate the companies. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be some kind of consultancy or support organization to help failing small states. And today we have seen, okay, fairly poor states failing, maybe in Africa and Middle East, but we will in the future maybe also see countries in, uh, in Europe and other places are actually coming into uh, disarray. So there is a need for governance support, so to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Concrete governance support. Thank you. Okay, <coughs> take two one. questions. You want to take, take some more? Okay. Yeah, take more. Then okay, I'll who, who, who was next? Yeah. Anybody? Yes, yes please, please come to the microphone. Yes. Thank you, Ambassador and My name is Sun Xi. Yeah, a Chinese graduate from our school. Uh, actually, my question is very simple, but uh, I'm afraid I need the audience help. Because after you read uh, his book, you know, in his book uh, he proposed a uh, 777 formula to reform the Security Council <laughs> of UN. So I, I would like to know your comments yeah, about the, the formula. So may, maybe our dean will explain the formula later. Okay, I, yeah. I'll explain the formula yeah. briefly to him. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question is UN Security Council reform. Next question. Yes, please. 
Yeah, I think after this we can give some answers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Raymond Kwok from Oxford Economics and VC.com. Uh, Ambassador, uh, you mentioned at the end of your speech about three things alleviate poverty, sustainabilities, mm. and institution, the importance mm. of it. Uh, can you share with us your thoughts how that can be uh, sort of uh, resolved? Uh, I'm in particular, I come from a private sector. Uh, can you share with us how does a private sector can be work together with the public sector? I'm in particularly interested to hear your views about the triple P public sector participation, and how can that be uh, used to alleviate the three major focus that you have mentioned? Okay, can I quickly explain the 777 yeah. formula? Yeah. <laughs> I, I propose that there be seven new permanent member states. The seven will be uh, United States, China, Russia, and Europe will have a single seat, European Union, and the three most populous states from each continent, Brazil, Nigeria, and India. So there will be the seven permanent members. And then we create a second category of seven, of 20, uh, seven seats for non-permanent members, but automatically rotated every four terms among 28 states. And the 28 states are what you call the middle powers, you know, those who... So that this, the reason for this is that, you know, the, re the reason why we hadn't had security mm. council reform is that for every India that wants to come in, there's yeah. a Pakistan that says, why not me? Mm -hmm. For every Brazil that wants to come in, there's an Argentina that says, why not me? So all the Pakistans and Argentinas and South Koreas and all, they join the category of the automatically semi-permanent members. Mm. And then you have the third category of seven elected members from the uh, rest of the small states. So great powers, middle powers, small states, 777. But you have to read the book to get the full version. <laughs> <laughs> I will read the book, don't worry. I already told Linda Moore to put it in my bag, so I'm sure I have it on the plane. Don't I worry. <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> the first person to read my book. <laughs> uh, well, should you okay, want to yeah, go ahead, go ahead, take these well, three questions. I, I think we have a long way to go for a worldwide election. Although I like your, I like the idea that you would really have more transparency and you would know who you, you would vote for. We have a system which I personally am a bit hesitant to, 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 to suggest that we should continue. But there has been a circulation more or less among continents. Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, uh, Latin America, and the circulation. So now and it's now the next next round. Europe now turn. it's Europe's turn. If if we were to follow that uh, circulation pattern, that limits the choice from the beginning, and then you have uh, a combination of a search which is very very low key and not openly, and then you have some who go out and actively on campaign. So it is uh, it is a system which doesn't relate to uh, the public uh, opinion. It goes to convincing member states governments. That's where we are today. But I, I like the fact that there should be more, more transparency and that the leadership of the United Nations should be also felt uh, among people. But there has been an interesting, interesting tendency how quickly that person who gets that job is becoming the symbol of international cooperation and your hope for the future. How much shall uh, you've seen it with Kofi Annan and now with Ban Ki-moon that yes, there is hope for this person. So the, the, the hopes are attached to this person almost automatically after the election. Uh, the uh, failed states, yes. I think we should realize that the failed states are dangerous for us too. That's the point we have to make. And I have two examples. 90% of the opium of the world comes from what was at least earlier a failed state, Afghanistan. Well, it completely undermines a generation of young people and uh, others also in all over the world, this opium. Uh, Somalia was con considered a failed state. Well, where is the best organized piracy operation in the world? In Somalia. What has that led to? That 20% of the shipping through the uh, uh, canal uh, in Egypt is now going around South, uh, to South Africa with a tremendous waste, CO2, and insurance rates going up. Evidently, I heard the figure of 20-30% insurance rise uh, because of this. So we are completely. We have to make the point that a failed state is hurting us also, and that is sort of the basis for action. And action has to be done in three areas: peace, stop the horrible war in Syria; secondly, uh, work against inequalities, development needs. Uh, but that requires also good governance, so that there is a structure that really can can take care of that. So yeah, I come back to my model, peace, development, human rights, uh, and that we should have a program that combines the efforts of the member states. 
because this can never be imported from abroad. It has to be coming also from within. Short answer to a very good question. Uh, well, Kishore 777, it sounds like you have a job here uh, <laughs> with uh, convincing the member states. You, the, the biggest difficulty with your formula will be the first seven. Mm. <laughs> mm. Who will be happy, who will be unhappy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I can have, this I really cannot speculate, not even <laughs> off the record. <laughs> uh, this is the most sensitive subject to touch upon. But I, I think uh, Security Council reform is necessary, and I hope the member states will move on this issue, because it has to do with, as you know from our time together in the United Nations, mm. it has to do with the whole legitimacy. Uh, of the Security Council. The Security Council must, of course, reflect the world as it is today and not as it was 1945. But I was leading uh, these negotiations back in 2005 and 6, and it was the most difficult negotiation. In fact, I decided not to push it so hard because otherwise uh, I don't think we would have got the Human Rights Council, the Peace Building Commission, the uh, anti -terror, the counter-terror strategy if we had brought in that because the, there was a tendency to put everything in a package. The Security Council was, issue was so infected, it still is. But uh, I hope that one perhaps could move in the direction of something which is feasible even before we reach your 777 formula. Mm -hmm. And that is to reduce the use of the veto. Uh, the veto power is of course the reason why the great powers take the United Nations still seriously. Uh, on the other hand, if the, if the veto power is used stopping action where really international peace and security is in danger, then uh, the legitimacy of the Security Council will be affected. You see it right now in Syria. Secretary General and I and our colleagues are criticized for not seeing action in Syria. Well, the basic problem is that we have divisions inside the Security Council on Syria. Uh, and therefore, I think the, the Permanent Five need to realize that they have a responsibility for international peace and security. I should accept that. And I would hope that the veto power should be used only exceptionally, only as a sign of not, not making it. I was about to say a sign of failure. Uh, do, you, do you want to say a word to them about the S5 group and what they tried yeah, to do? The, yeah, the... Uh, Singapore is a member of the S5 Yeah, the S5 as a... The S5 and the P5, there was a sort of, <laughs> the, the small, there was small, five nations, including Singapore and Switzerland and I think Jordan and, uh, well, New Zealand, I don't know, smaller countries. Costa Rica also. Yeah. They presented uh, some very good uh, proposals about uh, more transparency and also that the veto power should be reduced. Uh, and they had one suggestion which I know caused some problems with the P5 and was that uh, one should report to the, to the General Assembly why you cast you the veto. veto yeah. I don't know whether that survived your proposals uh, in the end, but that was considered an infringement of, of the Security Council uh, mandate according to the P5. So the, the S5 withdrew their proposal, didn't you, last fall? Uh, but I, I would say that, if I may take some risks here, speaking a little bit personal, uh, if, the security, if the veto is used only exceptionally, and you are really developing the United Nations Security Council into a negotiation body, because that is what we need to do. Because in the past, the veto was cast almost automatically during the Cold War from the Soviet Union in the 50s, notoriously. Then Western powers cast the veto on Middle East almost automatically, even on South Africa. Can you believe it? And there were very few examples where the Security Council came together and negotiated. After the end of the Cold War, we could have had much more of negotiations on Security Council resolutions. And I think the Security Council should turn more and more into a negotiation body and negotiate the resolutions and avoid the veto. Uh, of course, in the end, it might be difficult. But my joke on this is that the Security Council could think of how the Catholic Church selects popes. Mm. <laughs> They lock them up <laughs> in the Sistine Chapel. And only, only when they can say Il Papa, the white smoke comes out, they've, they've done their job. 
So uh, I don't know whether this works. Um, maybe it's a bit daring for a deputy secretary to suggest this, but uh, <laughs> I still stand for it. The last one on uh, uh, yeah, yeah, right, poverty, the, sustainability, and um, well, uh, institutions. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think uh, the, the private sector has a role on all three these aspects. Uh, we, we will have, hopefully, a poverty eradication program, which will be hopefully looking like something like the MDGs of today. Very concrete goals on sanitation, on maternal health, child mortality, and so forth. We will probably need to have those that figures. And, and in order to achieve that, there is a need for the private sector to help with technology, to help with training, uh, to to uh, to to play actual role in in uh, in sustainable growth in these countries. On, on sustainability, I think any company today who doesn't have sustainability in its policy uh, objectives would, would fail. The, 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 you, there also technology can play a very important role. And I also hope that the private sector, particularly the banking sector and the e private equity funds and the pension funds could realize that they, there is a good investment in renewable energy in the sustainability investments. I would hope that we would have a, a private sector in, interest in investments in sustainability. I think it's also good business. I would hope that trend will be strengthened. And then I also think the, uh, the uh, private sector has an importance in, in, uh, in good institutions, uh, accepting that anti-corruption is a serious uh, part of the agenda, uh, accepting that there has to be trade rules that are abided by, and that they would see it as a positive that there are rules and regulations that work rather than a murky area. So I, I would hope that it would be in the enlightened self-interest of business to be on the side of the forces that are going to show the road ahead after 2015. Can I just add a small qualification, the veto question? You know, uh, you, you mentioned a formal veto, but you know, when we, when we serve on the UN Security Council, we discovered that the formal veto is not the important one. Every day in the informal consultations, yeah. there was an informal veto that happened two, three times a day. Mm -hmm. And all that any of the P5 member delegation had to say, even on procedural questions, oh, no, no, we don't support this. And then discussion stops. Yeah. So the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the censorship that comes from the I, veto I, is not the formal veto, it's the informal veto that's also very powerful. I hope I'm not too indiscreet, but I persuaded uh, Kishore to be positive to Singapore running for the Security Council. Yeah, at first we were reluctant. Yesterday. You were reluctant at the beginning, uh, but uh, you were a very good member of the Security Council, and you were president twice, I think. Yes. But I also want to, I don't look, want to look like I'm just deeply critical of the Security Council. I, I, when I was mediating in the Darfur crisis, I was very much helped by the fact that I was reporting to the Security Council. Because when I was stuck in the negotiations, and this was not only in Darfur case, it was also other negotiations, Iran, Iraq, and others. Uh, if the other side was completely inflexible, my most effective line was to say to them, well, I, I note what you hear. I note what I hear, and of course I have no choice. I will have to report this to the Security Council. Mm. That, that, that frightened them. That wasn't bad. <laughs> so the following day, you had a different twist to it. So yeah. uh, they have a powerful position, but they, yeah. I, I hope that they will, would also. I'm so influenced now by the Syria crisis. I would really mm. hope that they would avoid the, the veto, but also, as you said, the threat of yeah. the use of the veto. Okay, next question, please. Short, sharp. We'll take three questions again. Short. Over here, over here. Thank you very much. My name is Ais. I'm just a lay person, sir. Mr. Ambassador, I'm very impressed with your, you know, eloquent, straightforward, honest uh, assertion. But the question is that it's quite contradictory sometimes. It is not so difficult to subscribe to what you prescribe, but sometimes the contradiction appeared to be subsequently in the case, that, for example, when Dean was asking for, in the context of his ideation which you should consider officially rather than just reading uh, as a matter of personal basis, firstly. Secondly, with regard to when you talk about the term of reference, new world, if the UN is a monopoly, no alternative, it's not a new world, it's a yesterday world. So my question here is that with regard, with regard to uh, essence of substance, uh, the question is that 
the veto should not be on the table at all. So a complete eradication of the veto is the necessity, the warranty of 21C. So if the UN is not willing to forego the, the, the veto tools, then I think it makes no sense to talk about it. Now, my other question is that, in, in, in the question of your uh, commandment, or your kind of uh, prescription, the question is that, uh, you issue the, ace, the basis of those uh, elements that you suggested, but you didn't mention the platform. For example, the foundation of value over virtue, or is it virtue over value? Thanks. Okay, next, next question. Um, Keshava yeah, from the Lee Kuan Yew School. Uh, good evening, Ambassador. Um, my question is actually, again, in regards to Syria. Um, it seems as if the civil war would continue, and there is a possibility the death toll might double in, if it continues for a few more years. Um, what other alternative is the United Nations thinking of in regards to Syria? Um, this is also in regards to, I mean, looking back at the Sri Lankan civil war, uh, the United Nations didn't seem to be too effective. Um, it was almost going towards a genocide. Um, so I'd just like to ask, how would the United Nations um, tackle Syria? Thank you. Okay. Next question, please, yes. Um, thank you. I was very interested to hear... Um, Can you identify yourself? Sorry. Uh, my name is Mario Santos from Cambridge University Press. Um, and I was very interested to hear about your, um, your comment about being involved in the, um, Rohi one of the Rohingya minority negotiations earlier on, which is, of course, an increasingly important um, subject for all of us in Southeast Asia. And I was wondering if you could comment on, on that negotiation specifically and also your assessment of the current situation and what possible solutions might be. In Myanmar? In Myanmar, yes, of course. You've got three difficult questions. <laughs> okay. The veto, Syria, and Rohingyas. <laughs> <laughs> Am I paid for this? <laughs> Can somebody buy him dinner after this? <laughs> I think well, Ambassador Vanu Gopal has agreed to take you off. Okay. Give him an extra <laughs> glass of wine. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, um, veto power. Of course, in an ideal world, um, we would not have a veto power. But um, I think one of the lessons from the League of Nations was that the great powers never took the League of Nations seriously and left and came as they liked. And one of the conclusions from the failure of the League of Nations was that we have to make sure that the great powers of the world uh, really use this organization for their national security policies. And I think the price that was paid for this was the veto power. I, I think this uh, document is one of the most beautiful documents that we have. I I'm really enormously impressed by those who wrote this charter. And I think they wrote this charter about this sector about veto power with some reluctance, but realizing that it was the way to get the major powers to use the United Nations. So here we are with this dilemma that I see every day, to recognize the United Nations as a reflection of the world as it is, and not as a reflection of the world as we would want it to be. That is the constant tension that I feel in my daily work. I would hopefully never forget what the world should be, what we are striving for. But if I, I wouldn't do my job right if I didn't understand that I also would have to world, work with the world as it is. So here is this dilemma that you have, which is written into the absolute beginning here. We the peoples but represented by the states and their governments. So, um, well, value and virtue is, well, I would simply come back to the charter on that one. <laughs> this is what I believe in. Uh, the second question on Syria, well, the, you can just look at the difference between Libya and Syria. In Libya, you, you, the veto was not used. It was an abstention. And that meant that the action taken by a certain group of countries, was mainly NATO countries, supported by others, 
uh, including my own, by the way, since there was a binding security constitution, we helped also as a neutral country or non-aligned. Um, and there you had an action which was uh, also containing in the end a military element. In the case of Syria, that has not been done. There's been no step taken, no, no sign that the divisions between major powers among the P5 come to set the same conclusion. When that is the case, our muscular power goes down drastically. We brought in two of the best people in the world when it comes to negotiating and finding solutions, international solutions, Kofi Annan and Lakta Brahimi. And La Kofi Annan resigned openly out of frustration that the Security Council could not deliver a message to the government and to the opposition uh, and really force, if I use the expression, negotiations to come about. When you don't have that support from the body of the United Nations, which, which is responsible for international peace and security, you are seriously weakened as a secretariat. And that's the frustration that I expressed earlier. And also Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, feels very strongly. When I sit with him and talk about this war, and if I, for instance, ask, he, uh, he asked me two months ago, when does uh, Lakta Ibrahimi come to, to uh, Damascus next time? I said, in 10 days' time. And then he said, 10 days? That's 1,500 people dead. It was 150 a day. Then. So that's how we look at this. We are limited, and we, we regret it deeply. What we can do is, of course, to try our best to get the political talks going. Like Dabrahimi was pretty close a month ago, too, when there was a sign of negotiation, will of negotiation on the sign of the leadership of that time, Al-Khatib, and we tried then to get others to move on the government. We, we, but then that opportunity seems to be lost. We, I hope it's not lost completely. But without a binding security council resolution which states what has to be done with the sanctions possibilities, etc., you are weakened. What we can do is then, as we always do, try to reduce the suffering, which is incredible. I was in Beirut with my, with my colleague here, Pim Valder, just two months ago. And uh, at that time, there were 150,000 refugees in, in, uh, in Lebanon. Now they have 450,000 in this small country with these sectarian uh, tensions coming, growing by the day. So what is, what is threatening is, of course, a, a continued regional crisis or even worsening regional crisis. Lebanon is strongly affected. Jordan is strongly affected. Also, Iraq, as you see signs now of the sectarian divides going deeper, which has a relationship to the conflict in Syria. So this humanitarian work is going on. Our colleagues are doing, taking grave risks for their lives, uh, helping out. The Syrian Red Crescent has done a very good, good job helping us. We try to cross lines inside the country. This was my job many years ago. I worked with these issues. Uh, we help with the refugees, and it's, it's a daily toil, an enormous, enormous task, a tragic uh, situation. We are fighting for resources. We only have 35% uh, covered, uh, covering uh, the uh, appeals. So still, we need resources to, 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 to help on the humanitarian field. But I, I have really no good news uh, on Syria. I wish I had. On Sri Lanka, I, I have a very important responsibility now. Uh, we have received the very critical report about the Sri Lanka action uh, internationally and also including United Nations, which was delivered to us three months ago. Uh, and uh, we are now working with that and drawing the conclusions for the UN from the Sri Lanka experience. And uh, this is going to be a very important report and for me very important recommendations to give the Secretary General. But we take it very seriously, this report. And if there were failures, we have to reduce those risks of failures in the future. Uh, last question. Uh, well, what happened was that in... March, April 1992, I was sent to um, Bangladesh and uh, Myanmar to negotiate the return of uh, over 100,000, I think, Rohingyas that had been forced over the border. I was first in Bangladesh and saw the camps at the Cox Bazar area uh, and also the government, of course, in, in Dhaka. And then I spent a week or so with the uh, 
with the, uh, with the Myanmar uh, government. Uh, in the end, I spent uh, hours, many hours, with the leader of the Slork at that time, which was, who was Kin Yunt. And with him, uh, we finally got an agreement uh, of the return of 50,000 Rohingyas within, I remember, a three-month period. And um, there, I, I was also, when I was in, in Myanmar, I also were, was in the area where the Rohingyas lived. And I understood these tensions uh, between the different parts of the population and the political dimensions of the Rohingya issue. And I wasn't surprised that later on, uh, now, just recently, we have uh, continued problems since the Rohingyas are not accepted as a minority inside the country. What I would hope would not happen is what I, you and I talked about before this started, and I made mention uh, during my speech that I, I would hope that the uh, religious aspect, the aspect of Muslims and, and, and Buddhists, are not growing into a reason for conflict. Uh, and here, of course, there is a great need for leadership uh, from the side of, of, uh, of uh, the uh, new leadership, the uh, sort of new leadership in, in, in Myanmar. Uh, I, I am impressed by the different steps taken. I hope that they will be able to cope with this so that we don't see explosions of a very dangerous nature, but which also go deeper than just a conflict because it is then the relationship between different groups, uh, different religious uh, groupings. Uh, and if those elements enter a conflict, you also enter an emotional element which has grave political consequences and where sometimes this turns into a political uh, confrontation uh, with these ethnic and cultural and religious dimensions which make the conflict so much more difficult to solve. But I very much hope that Southeast Asia will continue to be good news and that this will not flare up into something more serious. Well, I can tell you it's not just Southeast Asia, but I think broadly speaking, the world as a whole, even though, of course, when you come to a session like this, we only discuss the bad news. It's quite natural. We discuss Syria, Rohingyas and all that. There's also a lot of good news in the world. And frankly, I agree with the, the premise of the title, which is our new world. And if you look at our new world, the, the world is, generally speaking, getting better and better place. Wars are diminishing, poverty is diminishing, middle classes mm. are growing. But the reason why the world is getting a better place is because there are lots of strong, silent warriors working very hard behind the scenes to create a better world. And one of the strong, silent warriors is Jan Eliasson. So now please join me in thanking him for his wonderful <laughs> presentation and his contributions. <laughs> the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy.